Hello, everyone. Today is Friday, November 11th, 2022. It is Veterans Day. So for myself and Trade Risk, thank you everyone, past and present, who has served on this day and every day, frankly. Now, for those of you who tune in every single week, you know the routine here. Our job is to break down the most important trends, price action, noteworthy moves. There were a lot of noteworthy moves this week across financial markets. We're here to break it all down for you. We break our analysis up into two parts. In part one, we look through the numbers. We pick apart everything that stands out, looks a little different or interesting. And then in part two, we jump into the charts. We look at price action very closely and measure those broad market trends. Today's video will be a full length video for everyone. So we are not going to do a free and extended version. Everyone's getting the full length video today. So stick around. We got lots to talk about for this week. Now, top of the headlines here, we had huge risk on moves following the inflation data. CPI inflation came in 7.7%. That was the headline number year over year, which was weaker than expected. Core inflation lower than that as well. And markets really took off there. Now, there's some interesting positioning going into that event and how markets were sort of set up that sort of give gave the market so much fuel to rise after that number. But here we are with a very strong week for risk assets broadly. We had the dollar breaking its year-long uptrend and putting in uh, one of the worst weeks for the dollar index going back decades. Uh, so it was certainly in the top, you know, five percentile in terms of weakness out there for the dollar. We know how strong those inverse correlations have been between dollar and risk assets. We saw interest rates basically across the maturities fall to multi-month lows. And we also had some pretty historic and terrible, um, you know, fallouts in crypto land, SBF, FTX, pretty much single handedly melting down those markets and causing a lot of pain on that industry, which has suffered a lot of pain this year. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. So let's get into it here by the numbers. Here is the one week returns. These look like monthly returns, but they were just for this week. Very green across the board. Standout here was the NASDAQ 100. This was really a risk on rally, particularly in tech and some of the growth names and just really the higher beta areas of the market is really what fueled um, the uh, the move to the upside this week. Uh, world stocks, as we pointed out, though, you know, they're continuing to do pretty darn well. Uh, weakening dollar probably helps as well. But look at those one month numbers here for the ACWX index up 15 percent. That's actually beating all all of uh, the local U.S. indices here, although I don't have the Dow Jones on this, and uh, I'm sure the Dow one-month numbers would be a little bit stronger. Now, this is basically what um, most markets looked like on, on Thursday following that CPI data. We had uh, this chart basically illustrating one-day returns here. So for the NASDAQ 100 index, we saw uh, about a 7.5% rally here, and that goes all the way back to uh, the COVID times, which uh, of course, if you recall back then after the initial leg down as all of the stories uh, were unfolding with COVID and and uh, the panic was really just, um, you know, kind of uh, accelerating throughout media at that point. Um, this is when this type of magnitude move, this 7% move was, was basically right at the bottom here. This is what essentially uh, marched us off and started this new uptrend as the Fed, you know, intervened and, and started to uh, inject liquidity, liquidity into the system. And fiscally, of course, but this is what uh, this was basically the magnitude of the move. And again, it's just if you go back even further, there's not many times you're going to see uh, a, a, the Nasdaq 100 up seven percent. That is a massive move for markets. Now, in terms of trends, what has this actually done? Well, we're actually beginning to repair some of the damage here. So what you'll notice now is the 50 SMA is beginning to rise here in the S&P, in the Russell, in uh, ACWX. It's actually not rising yet in the NASDAQ 100. So if you recall, as we've been very clear on here, the NASDAQ 100 has been the underperformer for the past, you know, 
I mean, let's call it a month, but certainly longer than that as well. It had one of the steepest drawdowns year to date, uh, right down the list. And so the the bounce back this week was certainly more extreme, but it still needs more uh, to repair that longer term damage. So slowly but surely, these trends are starting to reverse here. The long term 200 SMA is still very much declining here in all of the major indices. It's going to need a lot more time, I think, before we start repairing anything there. But uh, the evidence here, at least in the short term, short term trend and uh, this primary trend starting to turn to the upside. Now, volatility environment, this is something, of course, we track every single week. And we've been talking about uh, the bullish behavior here, the, the sort of um, the heavyweight, the, the sinking action in, in volatility indices here that they've been wanting to go lower. And we see this week the, the S&P VIX at a 22 handle, which is something we haven't seen in a very long time, uh, down another two points this week. NASDAQ vol back below 30, Russell 2000 uh, also below 30 at 27. I mean, notice the relative difference here, though. The S&P 500 uh, volatility index much lower than the Nasdaq and the Russell. So again, you can see even just uh, between how volatility is being priced and, and future expectations on moves, um, the, the S&P has been just, again, a relative outperformer there. Now, 52-week highs and lows. This is where things get a little more interesting because, you know, we've got all this excitement. We've got this big, you know, surge off of the lows. Stocks are up, you know, double digits, 20%, some individual names or more this week. And yet the the action under the hood, the, the 52 week highs and lows list really didn't budge that much. In fact, we actually got more new lows made this week than we got new highs. That is a problem longer term when we think about just getting more structural uptrends, entering a, uh, dare I say, a bull market. You know, we need to see these numbers getting much more positive on the number of stocks hitting 52 week highs. I will say Friday's numbers again, uh, as a reminder, these are preliminary numbers. I have to just take estimated guesses. So typically, uh, they, they, they are a little more uh, uh, they're higher generally. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe even a hundred new highs made on Friday. Uh, but still that would, you know, doesn't, you know, it barely put, put this ratio even for the week. So nice to see, you know, less new, new lows being made, but we need to see more new highs being made, uh, to get a little more confidence and sustainability in this rally. Now, in terms of sector performance here, every single sector was in the green. We saw technology at the top of the list here, 10% for the XLK. So this is, again, just that big, uh, the, the worst looking sort of uh, house in the neighborhood is, is you know, um, getting its, its claim to fame, mixing so many <laughs> metaphors there. But technology at the top of the list up 10%, up now 14% over the past one month. Communication services and materials rounding out two and three. Uh, on the bottom side of things here, utilities and healthcare, very defensive tone of the market. They were the underperformers this week, which is basically what you'd want to see in a risk on type of move uh, and energy which has been doing lots of the heavy lifting also only up 1.87 percent this week now, if we take a look at IBD's data, so IBD, uh, shout out to Investors Business Daily. They're a sponsor of a lot of our content, so thank you. And you can support the show, support them by using our partner link here. And so they have a lot of different data tables that update every single day, just like you see me running through all of my data sets. They've got the same thing. And so when I'm looking at the industry ranks here, um, this is the top 10 industry ranks on uh, as of the close yesterday. And so again, we still see a lot of oil and gas domination here and this is what I'm going to be paying attention to is if this risk on rally has some legs to it and we start to see technology and some of these more growth areas of the market start to enter up trends and start to you know lead the market higher it'll be interesting to see if we can get some of these climbing through the ranks here in the coming week so that's what I want to keep an eye on uh, we can certainly you know keep a pulse on this as we move along here throughout the end of the year now 10 day correlations so you know this is is something we look at as a reminder 10 day correlations are very short term so they do change around quite a bit but it helps us keep a pulse on kind of what's moving uh together and, and what narratives are driving the action and so when we look here we're going to continue to note the fact that 
uh, we're getting a little bit of breakdown here in correlations in some of the equity ETFs. So, uh, or I'm sorry, the, just the major indices. So again, looking at the NASDAQ to the S&P to the Russell here, notice, uh, and this is all compared to the Dow, but I mean, 0.7 correlations, extremely high still, right? From any you know normal standard, these are still very highly correlated. But for most of this year, we've been running at like 0.9 or higher. And so we're starting to see these breakdown in correlations. This isn't the first time we, we talked about it. We talked about it last week. And this is, again, in my opinion, a good sign. It's something where you want to see a stock picker's market. You want to see, um, you know, uh, risk takers discerning across these different indices. I mean, if we look at the dollar inverse correlation, that's still very, very strong here. So again, not nothing new, but again, maybe lo losing its grip just a smidge. Uh, Ten-year negative correlation as well. Um, you know, also very you know negatively inverse correlated still. Now, treasury yields. This was positive this week. We saw a sharp move lower here, going to multi-month lows. Ten-year yield back below 4%, uh, five-year below 4%. We're still inverted. We're still a mess, generally speaking. We still have high relative yields compared to where we were a year ago, but we are at least you know, coming down, cooling off maybe going sideways here in the short term. And again, that gives the market some coverage, some excuse to, um, you know, uh, help accelerate the risk on rally. Now, dollar and commodity performance here. So um, copper at the top of the list up 6% this week, gold at 5%. That's a big move for that metal. Uh, silver at 3.5%. Everything else, though, was negative. So even uh, agriculture ETF was, was about flat on the week. Crude oil was down this week. Dollar index was down massive this week. 4% is a huge move. Uh, again, one of the worst weeks as we led off in the top of the show for the dollar index in uh, many, many years. Uh, natural gas down 8% and Bitcoin down 20%. Now, Bitcoin here uh, clearly having the standout story. Now, this was well reported. I'm sure everyone's got the, the flurry of, of information and headlines and stories on what went down this week. But, you know, SBF, one of the largest uh, exchanges out there, again, mostly a, a non-U.S. They have a U.S. entity, but it was you know, largely traders outside of the United States, but they do a ton of volume. And basically, as we found out this week, they were uh, relatively un uh, insolvent, or let's say it didn't take much to get uh, the barrel kind of rolling downhill and it accelerated at a very fast pace. I won't break down the whole story. Again, there's plenty of articles out there. If you just Google uh, SBF FTX meltdown, you're going to see tons and, and you can read about it. But in terms of price action here, uh, the impact on Bitcoin and crypto was pretty extreme this week. Bitcoin down 19% so far on the week. And again, that just needs to be taken in context to the dollar index, which was down 4% this week, which would give a natural sort of tailwind to Bitcoin in, in most ordinary markets. And then obviously you had the NASDAQ up 8%. I mean, if you didn't have these events going, I wouldn't be surprised to have seen Bitcoin at 25K this week, but instead we're $9,000 below that uh, due to the liquidations and sort of panic and contagion fears out there. So um, very kind of interesting unfolding uh, story as we speak, but obviously, you know, for all those affected, uh, it definitely sucks. So hopefully uh, everybody gets their, gets their funds back and, um, you know, those centralized exchanges are risky. Now, last but not least here before we jump into part two is our current trade risk system positioning. And it's pretty boring out here. So in terms of our allocations right now, our two trading systems, Merlin and Lamerick, Lamerick's totally flat, 100, just 100% cash going into the weekend. I haven't looked at what signals are on deck for Monday. Maybe there's, you know, a, a bunch of new signals on deck. Um, I'm not sure, but going into the weekend, totally flat. As you recall, you know, this, this has been, you know, pretty pressing on the short side over the past week or two. And so, um, you know, the fact that it is now flat is, uh, I guess, at least a good thing there that we're, you know, not continuing to hold any shorts. Uh, Merlin here, a little bit more long. It does have some defensive positioning. It did start, you know, buying some dollars and, and some different stuff there, uh, but still, you know, pretty uh, conservative, all things um, considered. So trade risk index, only 9% exposed. So uh, we do have $1 trials. You get a lot more information if you want to learn about how these systems work. Um, but with that, we'll leave it there and we'll see you in a second here with part two. 
All right, we are back. We've got TC2000 open. We are looking at the S&P 500 cash settled market weekly chart currently. And this is where we landed here going into the weekend. 5.9% up week for the S&P 500. That's basically good for two month highs. Last time we were at these levels around 4,000, we were, we were bearish engulfing to the downside. I believe this was probably Jackson Hole or the Fed, you know, uh, hawkish rhetoric that Powell was giving us and markets were sort of, um, you know, working their way lower um, during this time. So we've got the complete opposite now. We're trying to take the elevator back up and let's go down to the daily chart and let's put on our roadmap that we've been, you know, really kind of keeping things very simple and, and measuring and mapping um, the key sort of supply demand areas here over the past few months. Now, we spent a lot of time keying off of the June lows in lots of these markets for the S&P 500. That wasn't an issue last week. So, you know, last week, um, you know, when we recorded, we were we were here, we were down around 37.55. And basically, you know, the the position we had here was that expect chop and sort of directionless trading as we sit within this 3650, the June lows, and the uh, recent resistance here at 3900, and certainly prior resistance back in time. Um, while the market sat in between these zones, it was pretty much, you know, a short term traders market, flip a coin, expect volatility, so on and so forth. And we were sort of waiting for that breakout. Now, of course, um, you know, lo and behold, a few days later, with some extreme volatility, we are now breaking out. We are breaking out above 3,900 resistance. This is where the market ran into just a few weeks ago. It tapered off. It, it, you know, failed right in here where it should have, or we would expect that there would be some resistance. It pulled back pretty aggressively. And again, stair stepped higher, pulled back on Wednesday, right? Uh, this was also when the whole uh, SBF FTX breakdown meltdown was occurring here. And of course, you know, crypto, um, contrary to, you know, belief, and, and it does put pressure on what equity markets are doing here as well. Uh, there are lots of monies and, you know, some of the institutions that are you know, in both markets or have books, um, you know, kind of spread across these different uh, asset classes will feel the pain. And so this was certainly, you know, fueling this sell off here prior to the CPI number that everybody was waiting for prior to the uh, or during, I'm sorry, the the FTX meltdown here, we saw this sell off and uh, really got people very bearish right before this big uh, release, we saw which I don't think I meant to include it in part one, the put call ratio, if you're just looking at um, um, the number of, of puts relative to calls trading, it was at an extreme level that we haven't seen again, top percentile in extreme positioning, but prior or leading into the CPI number where just tons of puts were outstanding or lots of protection being purchased. And then of course we get this, um, I guess, optimistic, let's call it number um, where inflation wasn't as bad as expected. Maybe they give the Fed some more leniency, so on and so forth. And the market skyrockets from there with the most amount of people offside. So that's, you know, that's the, the, the high level to the, to the micro level here on how this all unfolded. We saw a five and a half percent move up in the S&P 500 a gap and go type session where the open print was the low of the day. And then we proceeded to rally all day, broke through this resistance and then found follow through on Friday. So. With that backdrop now, we ask ourselves, where can we expect price to go? Where are we headed from here? Well, we're at 4,000. We did cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. We are overbought on the short term, okay? What does that actually mean? Well, not usually a whole lot because when markets are moving to fresh new grounds, they typically like to stay overbought. But of course, with each incremental day here that the market kind of pushes higher, it becomes tougher and tougher to 
chase, right? It becomes tougher and tougher to want to buy in at these levels and it creates the FOMO. It creates the, um, you know, the market that people need to chase to get in. And that's currently what we see ourselves uh, experiencing is basically a market that is not letting anyone in too easily. So we're riding this upper Bollinger Band and the way I'm looking at this market is very simple here. 3,900. I mean, this is where we've had the level drawn on here for a long time for good reason, right? And because it is an influential um, inflection point in markets. And so for me, if the S&P 500 is above 3,900 here, then I want to be looking for buy opportunities. I want to be looking for excuses to be long. And I think the market can continue higher. I do think um, there's this big gap up here in uh, from September the 12th, 13th, and uh, where we peaked up here around 4,100. I wouldn't be surprised to see us up there. In fact, I mean, even as early as next week, uh, we just had a big move, but we're talking another 2% gap fill. Let the squeeze continue on here. Um, you know, it seems perfectly reasonable to me uh, to see this momentum continue. Now, um, on the downside, right? Where does this stop? Where can we get in? Again, 3,900 is where I would measure some risk against. Some folks would probably want to use the gap down here. So if we start filling this gap, uh, maybe that's where you're you're letting off the longs or you're getting less aggressive. But I think either either zone in here for you short term um, and even intermediate term traders, frankly. I mean, this is your kind of buffer zone right in here, probably where if we start to lose this or fall back into this level, then maybe the momentum is weakened too much and uh, it's time to reevaluate. So that's kind of where I'm looking at things. Uh, last week, you know, we talked about the S&P 500 position that I entered into, still have S&P 500 long on, so no real change. I did a little bit of maneuvering in here, but generally speaking, I still have this long position uh, in the S&P 500 and uh, happy to kind of see that working and uh, look you know, and reassess up at these areas here. Um, or if it starts to roll over uh, significantly enough, then, you know, that might be my excuse to get out. So that is sort of the roadmap there. I think bulls are in control. There's momentum and lots of folks offside. So uh, let's see how this plays out and see how far they can push this market. If we look at uh, the NASDAQ 100, now the NASDAQ 100 had a very different setup, right? We expressed very clearly that we hated or disliked on a relative basis the NASDAQ 100 compared to the S&P 500. And I won't rehash those. You can watch last week's videos, but basically, you know, being below the June lows, the relative weakness, I mean, I mean, this this was a really ferocious looking uh, bear flag here that basically you know took place. I mean this this looked as textbook as you could have wanted to see this market to just want to short the heck out of this market on Wednesday as this started to roll over below the June lows, worst of the indices, so on and so forth. And of course, you know, uh, as as fate would have it here, it's the exact opposite reaction. We just got this massive move to the uh, to the to the upside here as the most amount of people were offside shorting aggressively buying up puts. And, uh, you know, we squeezed higher and we are in the process of taking out resistance here. Uh, multi-month resistance at around this 282 area. So the NASDAQ 100, um, you know, very quickly has flipped and is starting to leg higher again here. Uh, I did put on a NASDAQ 100 position. It was on uh, Friday morning, basically at the open. So I'm very late to this position on a relative basis here, but I think it could get some legs uh, again, if it can uh, sustain above this 283, 284 area. I like to you know, basically put on positions as close to I know where I would be wrong in the position. So again, if we start rolling back over below 280, uh, then I can take the, you know, two, three point loss and just exit. Otherwise, I think there's some blue skies all the way up. Uh, you know, if we really get going here uh, up into the 300s or so for the NASDAQ 100, getting back up into the September, September highs, you know, filling these gaps, getting back up here. There's not a whole lot of room. Like there's a, this is a pretty good air pocket up here to move up to around 310. Again, not saying it's guaranteed, not saying we have to get there, but uh, it does seem reasonable here if the bulls can keep this momentum going. Now, last but not least, Russell 2000 here is already banging its head against some stiff resistance. Uh, very similar setup though. It had that big gap up. It's now testing, you know, this 190 zone here and, um, 
you know, coming back into some uh, more significant, I would say, overhead supply out of all the major indices. And remember, this was the index that started to kind of shape up a little bit earlier than the rest here. So the Russell uh, continuing to work and, uh, you know, back at resistance. So it's kind of the least interesting to me, um, just given its structure here coming back um, into these levels. So hopefully that's, you know, helpful and sort of a, a you know, understanding roadmap of kind of where we are, where we could go. Uh, if we look at the volatility index, so if we just take a look at VIX here, we're at the lowest levels, 22.5 uh, going into the weekend here. So very nice continued unwind here in VIX, you know, Will this end at some point? You know, when we will when will we get this spike back up in the VIX and 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 so on and so forth? Of course, you know, it will happen. We are gonna get the knee-jerk reaction. This isn't a perma bull sort of analysis here. This is just the current market analysis. And I think we need to respect the momentum um to the upside here. Cause I do think when you think about the seasonality, the sentiment, the positioning, the way all of this unfolded. I do think uh, there are a lot of folks offsides and that this momentum can continue to carry us at least a little bit further here. So um, that's kind of the read here. Again, uh, our belief is always, you know, lower the VIX, the better for, for if you're long, if you're bullish markets, you want to see lower volatility. You want to see, you know, the fear and, and anxiety out of the markets. And so, um, you know, uh, the, the lower we, the, the, the longer we can stay in the lower 20s here, the better uh, off, you know, this this market has at uh, sustaining a, a, a sustainable market uh, rally. Now, if we look at the um, TLT, so TLT is the long bond. A lot of folks look at that. I like to look at IEF as well. It's kind of the middle of the curve around 10 year maturities. And you can see both of these on the weekly basis here, getting a nice strong move to the upside. Again, 2.7% for the 10 year treasury bond is, is a very big move. Uh, TLT up almost 4%. And so we got this gap up here and we're trying to kind of you know, break this downtrend that we've seen, right? And on the other side of this, of course, is interest rates as yields. They're the inverse as to this relationship. And so we're trying to break this multi-month downtrend here. And it is in the process of doing that, right? Like we can kind of see the very orderly downtrend that bonds have been in here for the past three, four months uh, has been broken as with this gap up and significant volume on Thursday. And we're kind of hanging in here on Friday. So uh, I also purchased some TLT um, on Thursday. So again, not necessarily new or in anticipation of the move, but more so after the move here and looking to see if this break can take us higher, um, you know, even even just a little bit more of a, of a retrace counter trend move back up here into the, you know, 104, 105 area. Um, and, you know, that seems, again, pretty reasonable, probably lines up with, you know, NASDAQ up here around 310 or something like that. If that's if that's the world we can see in the next month or two you know, going into year end, let's call it, that seems pretty reasonable to me. And then we'll reevaluate. And then when we, as we come into resistance here and the, you know, um, everybody's chasing, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten percent 10% higher, then um, that would probably be the point to, to sort of take some risk off and reevaluate and prepare for, you know, more chop or, or what have you. Right. Um, so that's, kind of the way I'm looking at it. That's the move we saw there in the TLT. Uh, if we look at gold, gold had a big move this week, 5.17%. Uh, so a big follow through week. Uh, last week, I believe we talked about this little bullish engulfing bar that got put in here right at support. And then here we are again, uh, racing higher again in the short term, all these markets. I mean, look at GLD in the short term is totally stacked above and trading without above the uh, two and 20 Bollinger Band. So none of these markets, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see a day down or, or two days down here. But it seems like uh, we're certainly getting that um, uh, change of trend in lots of these markets for the uh, short to intermediate term. Now, of course, at the sort of uh, helm of all of this is the dollar and the dollar index saw one of its worst weeks all, all going back decades, uh, 3.96%. And we're finally starting to, you know, sort of thrust off of, let's see if I can clean this up, thrust off of this, um, you know, this trend line that we've been in this trend uh, for the past year or so. And we're 
violently sort of breaking off of it. And as we've talked about, you know, every single video, these correlations between the dollar, between risk assets, between uh, the flow of capital here, you'd want to see a breakdown in dollar. You want to see yields down. You want to see the VIX lower. Those are the three kind of horsemen that we talk about every single week. If you want to get a sustained equity market, you need to see those three things start to break down or reverse or at least consolidate. And we now have all three of them doing that. And so it shouldn't be, um, you know, that much of a surprise to see such a big move is because we're finally getting the VIX in the 20s. We're finally getting the dollar to break down and we're finally getting interest rates to cool off. And so all of those things that we talk about is happening and um, it's happening abruptly and quickly and all at once. But these are uh, the significant moves that um, took place this week. So uh, everything kind of plays its part here. And uh, right now, bulls getting to enjoy a little bit of uh, time in the sun. We'll see how long um, they can they can do that. But uh, that, I think, kind of covers all of the majors. I'm looking at my notes here that I wanted to talk about. So let's take a look. Last but not least, oh, actually, two 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 other uh, views here. So this is our um, sector internals here that we track and show every so often. Uh, so these are all the individual sectors by the percentage of stocks that are above a 200 SMA. And so again, you can see just kind of this gradual uptrend here as stocks are are slowly reclaiming their 200 period uh, simple moving average, their long term trend, let's call that. And uh, you can see, you know, even despite, for instance, technology, which is up here, uh, having such a big week, we only have 42% of, of uh, technology stocks above a 200 period simple moving average. So again, there's some room to go. There's some room to move up as some of these stocks start to uh, at least get back into some short to, to medium term uptrends. Uh, and you can look at this list here and just see the relative strength amongst the different sectors. Now, speaking of sectors, uh, we always finish off here with some um, scanning of uh, sectors and industries to kind of see what's moving uh, significantly. There's none on the bearish side. So these are all kind of showing up here, 49 on the bull side. I'm not going to go through all of these this week. So again, what I would suggest is just hitting pause. You can see these are all of the specific industries that are making some pretty notable moves this week, either fresh breakouts or fresh volume uh, moving to the upside. So asset management, for instance, or auto parts breaking to multi-month highs. And of course, you know, a week like we saw, there's going to be plenty. Um, on the sector level, we had financials breaking to new multi-month highs. We had materials breaking to new multi-month highs. Again, none of these are fresh moves, but they are existing moves. I think semiconductors is probably the biggest standout this week, 15.36%. Now, semiconductors, just three weeks ago, nobody wanted to own them. Everybody was selling off NVIDIA and all the other names um, because they were breaking to new lows. And we've just very violently V-shaped off of the bottom here. And we had a 15% up week for semis. So that was huge. And uh, XLI as well, back up to these multi-month highs. So that is it. I'll leave all these other industries for you to uh, take a look at. And uh, with that, I hope everyone had a, a good week out there. It was a violent week. It was a, it was a fast changing week. So hopefully everybody did well out there and uh, managed the volatility okay. Uh, let's keep an eye out on the shifting market regimes here. And, um, you know, we'll continue to monitor this every single week. Uh, we are, you know, certainly seeing a lot of bullish evidence this week, but it doesn't mean we should be permabulls or we need to forget about risk management. This is always something uh, that we need to, you know, basically take the data as it comes and adjust our expectations um, accordingly. So that is it for me. Thanks, as always, for tuning in and watching our Friday Stock Market Weekly analysis video. Hope everybody has a great weekend out there and we'll see you back here next week.